Office Hours is brought to you by Rebus Community and the Open Textbook Network. We at Rebus are uh, focusing on trying to help develop a clear, transparent process for making open textbooks, um, support that with some software tools, and finally imbue both the process and tools with a lot of collaboration and community input so that we can all come together to figure out a good sensible way to do this stuff. And so these um, uh, office hours pop up as in our discussions with the Open Textbook Network about specific issues that are challenges kind of in, in that universe. Um, I encourage you all to join the Open Textbook Forum, or sorry, the, uh, the Rebus Forum. So that's at forum.rebus.community, which Zoe will put into the chat. Um, I'm just going to hand the mic over quickly to Karen to talk about OTN and all the amazing work they do. Uh, and then Karen, if you could just pop back to me and I'll just lay out the agenda for how we'll run the rest of the event. Oh, and by the way, I'm Hugh McGuire, for those of you who don't know me or haven't met, um, and I'm the, what am I? I'm the Executive Director of the Rebus Foundation and the Rebus Community. Okay, over to you, Karen. All right, thanks, Hugh. I am Karen Lauritsen. I am the Director of Publishing and Collections for the Open Textbook Network, and we are very glad to partner with the Rebus Foundation on these monthly office hours. Together, we've been exploring questions in open textbook publishing um, for some time now. The Open Textbook Network is about 400 institutions now uh, across the United States, growing very quickly. Uh, many of them are consortial members, and uh, Michelle Reed, one of our guests today, is at an OTN institution. So we provide um, adoption, creation, and other support for using open textbooks through programming and professional development at the institutional level. All right. Uh, oh, one other thing um, that I'll put in the chat is we do have some information about accessibility in both of our authoring guides. We have an authoring guide and a modifying guide. So um, I'll put that here. I know um, Krista Gear has contributed um, to some of that content and she's uh, in this office hours here today. Okay, back to you, Hugh. Okay, um, thanks, Karen. Um, so again, just a bit of housekeeping of how this works. So we have uh, Josie Gray from BC Campus who's done a lot of accessibility work in their project. Uh, we have Jess Mitchell from OCAD, uh, which is the Ontario College of Art and Design University. Uh, and they have uh, the IDRC, which is the Inclusive Design Research Center. So uh, they do tons of work on accessibility of all kinds, and um, uh, Jess is a great resource. Um, we have Michelle Reed from University of Texas Arlington, um, also focusing on accessibility. I guess that's obvious. And Krista Greer, um, who's at University of Washington. Um, for all of you folks who are the special invited guests, I'd ask you to keep your talk to about five minutes. So just keep a nice short intro to the work you're doing and, uh, and then we'll um, open it up to comments. And, and that seems to be where a lot of the good stuff comes. So uh, I'll be a little bit brutal about um, cutting you off if you ramble on too long, but I'll try to do it nicely as well as um, insistently. So uh, I'm going to start with Josie to talk a little bit about your work and I'll, um, uh, I'll just flag you when we're, uh, when we're sort of, um, if we're passing five minutes. All right, so over to you, Josie. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name's Josie and I am an open textbook accessibility editor with BC Campus. Um, so my job is basically going through textbooks in the BC Open Textbook Collection and editing them so that they conform to web content accessibility guidelines. Um, so I come in after the book has been written and it's usually published by then and I go through and make edits to the book. Um, so I'm really involved in the details of like what it or what's necessary um, to make a book accessible while using Pressbooks. Um, so I use um, some of the, like a, one of the main tools I use is, is a screen reader um, to help me make a lot of the accessibility changes that I do because the way screen readers work is they use um, the markup of a web page to convey the information to non-sighted users. So it's very important that all um, of the aspects of a document be marked up properly, um, whether that be headings, uh, links, tables, um, the images have alt tags, and uh, things like that. 
Um, so um, while it's really useful to be comfortable with HTML markup, um, it's not necessary. There are a lot of workarounds in Pressbooks, um, so you can make all of these edits without having um, to be having to go into the text editor and actually change the HTML. Um, yeah, um, I kind of plan to talk for longer than 10 minutes, um, so I guess I don't really know what else I should say. Um, yeah, so I think I would be, like, like I've got a, um, excuse me, sorry, I'm getting kind of nervous. Um, no need. <laughs> a lot of pressure. Um, so I could talk a lot about um, the markup of open textbooks and um, the markup of chapters and the way the best way to do that to make textbooks accessible. Um, so I have uh, created a number of different documents that kind of walk you through the process of how to do that. So they would describe um, what to do uh, with the markup um, in regards to headings and links, um, making sure that you use um, link text that makes sense when taken out of context, um, that tables are marked up correctly using um, table headers and uh, caption tags, um, images um, using alt tags, and also how to do long descriptions for images that require uh, a description that uh, needs to be more detailed. Um, and also just things about uh, not conveying information solely through color. So that's for users who are maybe colorblind or who have poor vision. Um, yeah, and things like that. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. That's all right. Finish a little early. <laughs> Excellent. So um, as we'll find out in the open discussion part, uh, Josie's got a lot of very practical on the ground experience of working with um, HTML text in, in Pressbooks. So um, very useful. Thank you, jo Josie. Um, so we're going to go on to Jess now. Jess, I think your context is a bit different, but I'll let you uh, manage your introduction to that. Over to you, Jess. And way to go, Hugh, for getting all the acronyms right. Um, I am with OCAD University in Toronto where we have debilitating June colds, so please pardon my voice. Um, as Josie said, just to build on you, and thanks for taking the pressure and, and uh, going first, there are all these practical ways that we can build tools to help people make more accessible content. We can focus on the code, we can focus on tagging, we can focus on metadata, we can focus on some of the usual suspects um, like uh, alt, alt text uh, image descriptions. We can take a look at more interactive stuff and uh, try to make alternatives and uh, make it as multimodal as we can. And this requires, of course, that we have people trained in doing that, that we have authoring tools and interfaces that are built to enable that. Um, and it, it requires a kind of a, a sort of a expectation or a ramp up of an expectation for people who are using those tools. And as Josie said, some, some tools like, like uh, Pressbooks make some of that easier, which is great. Um, at the IDRC, what we wind up focusing on is the whole sort of ecosystem of what has to happen to make something an accessible piece of content. And part of what we like to focus on too is beyond uh, the practical stuff, though the practical stuff is so, so important not to, not to diminish that. We also need to train people to think through how to make things accessible so that they understand conceptually what's going on there. So we get into the practical pieces in terms of the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, um, using ARIA, uh, focusing on WCAG too. But we also extend beyond that and we want to start to think about pedagogically how do you think about presenting materials in a way that can make them accessible. What are some of the considerations that you should have in mind when you're creating the content at the beginning. And so if we can help educate people who are creating the content at the beginning, we feel as though we can have a pretty big impact. And I'll give you a quick example. We've been working with the folks at University of Colorado Boulder uh, make the wonderful FET simulations, the physics simulations. And they came to us and said, we, we know that these simulations are really visually based. There are a lot of mouse-driven mouse simulations. We want to make them more accessible. One of the things they said to us, too, is we don't just want to map the visual version to a kind of a screen reader interpretation of that. 
because the visual version allows learners to have these aha moments and to play and to discover and to do all these important things when it's important to understand um, a, a complex uh, principle like acceleration. They wanted that to be available to all users, as you can imagine, that's what the goal is. So what it required was thinking through not just making something keyboard accessible, but thinking through how to make it keyboard accessible and maintain the pedagogical goals of creating an opportunity of discovery for the learner so that they could still have that aha moment. They could still use a keyboard rather than a mouse and without vision, they could still conceptually participate in that, in that simulation and understand the, the physics principle. The end. <laughs> Okay, that's that's super. I think that the um, the important thing about Jess, what Jess seems to bring to the table in the discussions I've had, is really about the broader context and going kind of beyond the the checklist stuff. So again, we can talk about that a bit uh, later. So I will turn over now to Michelle um, and. Go at it. Okay. Hugh, I have to tell you, Liz gave us 10 minutes, so you're freaking everyone out right now with the five minute thing. Um, so I feel like I need to begin with confession. I um, I cringed a little when Hugh used the word expert. I am definitely not an expert in this area. Accessibility and universal design are not my strengths. I have very little formal training in this area, certainly not enough to fill comfortable or confident. However, I, I know enough to recognize how important these topics are and how underprepared I am for navigating this landscape on my own. Um, and I don't think this is an incredibly uncommon situation for uh, people who are creating OER to be in or those who are assisting faculty members in the creation of OER. So I wanted to spend my time today talking about my strategy for overcoming what I think is, is fair to call a weakness. So um, first, I think it's really important that we, uh, we recognize that we have a responsibility to ensure that the OER we create are accessible from the start and that our progress in this realm is prioritized. And to actualize this locally, I uh, was in dire need of some assistance. So two very important things happened to me around the same time just a few months ago. Um, that really helps me focus my attention on accessibility and also helps me um, to articulate how I was going to prioritize that for my uh, local efforts here at UTA. So the first thing is I stumbled upon a very intelligent and very thoughtful undergraduate student who was experiencing a bit of a crisis. So UTA offers an interdisciplinary minor in disability studies and one of the requirements for this minor is the successful completion of an internship. The library was approached by the director of the Disability Studies program uh, just before the spring semester started. And um, she told us about this graduating senior who was interested in education and publishing. And her, unfortunately for her, but very luckily for me, her internship fell apart right at the last minute. She was supposed to work with our Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence, but the person who was supposed to be her supervisor left and um, left her without an, an opportunity. So um, at the same time, Karen mentioned that we are members of the Open Textbook Network. So at the time that that was happening with the student, I was recruiting participants for our first Open Textbook workshop. So for those of you who are not familiar with OTN, one of the benefits of becoming a member is that the OTN sends two presenters to your institution to lead workshops on open textbooks. So you have a, a, a workshop for librarians led by a librarian and a workshop for faculty um, or other people who might be positioned to adopt open textbooks. So I was, at the time that all of this was happening with the student, that's really where my brain was. And that email popped up in my inbox um, about you know, urgently seeking an opportunity for the student. And it just made a lot of sense to me to bring her into the work that we were doing in open education. So um, that allowed us to help a student graduate as planned, which is a pretty good in result, just in and of itself. But it also allowed us to gain a better understanding of 
accessibility of existing OER that I was asking my local faculty to use or to consider. So um, I'm going to skip over some of the work that she did and we can come back to, to that stuff later. But essentially she evaluated, she created a, a rubric of sorts, looked at standards and best practices. So she created this evaluation instrument and then she applied it to 20 textbooks in total. So the second thing that happened around the same time as the, the student internship was um, Rebus announced the creation of a working group on accessibility in open textbooks. And it seemed like we were really working towards similar goals um, with Rebus, a much broader scope. I was focused on an institutional level, but we shared the same ambition of getting to a place where we could limit the need or completely eliminate the need for um, remediation at later stages. And I felt that opportunity to transition our default to um, to something that's really thoughtfully designed, high quality accessible OER from the start. It's one of the least discussed but highly impactful promises of OER because right now the situation with traditional commercial textbooks um, is, is wrapped up in uh, copyright permissions. And so we, because of that situation, we tend to duplicate effort um, that could easily be shared by different institutions and we unnecessarily limit access to accessible resources only to students who have a registered disability when we know that all students, regardless of their ability, can benefit from well-designed accessible resources. So I'm probably over five minutes, so I will stop there. Uh, that was bang on the money, actually, Michelle, I think. so. Awesome. Okay, so turning over to Krista, um, and my apologies for being more draconian about time out. I think that the value of the talking that we do afterwards always to me seems to me the most valuable. So anyway, over to you, Krista. All right, I'm putting my uh, stopwatch on. So I'm Krista, I'm at the University of Washington. I've been working with accessible documents formally at the UW for the last five years, managing the textbook conversion program for students with disabilities who are registered with our office. So I've been working in a very kind of retroactive as needed um, space, as opposed to the more proactive or slightly different industry of content creation. I'm more of the remedi remediation side as opposed to the, the proactive side. Um, but I've been in the industry for coming up on a decade actually so I've seen a lot of a lot of growth and changes and such what I also do is I manage the captioning program again for students with disabilities who need accessible videos and so I find that in the future I anticipate this kind of blending between the two file formats of documents plus videos are going to be a more going to become probably the norm maybe where there's even videos integrated within textbooks in electronic fashions and such. So for me, I felt like it was important to have a good grasp on both so we can deal with the concerns and uh, the implications of having that multimedia format. And so um, some thoughts that I'll offer for this group today is accessibility is really giving students with disabilities the same right to succeed or fail as any other student. And I think that's, that's really important. But what I also like is more of the universal design aspect, where essentially I try to create materials or retrofit materials that are device agnostic, ability agnostic, um, access to technology agnostic as much as possible. Or at least it could be turned into something that can be more readily usable by someone. So when we think of document creation or publishing or content creation, we should consider, you know, people who are non-traditional students who are not perhaps as tech savvy as some of our other uh, individuals that we work with. We need to consider the environments people are working in. Are they listening to their textbooks on the bus on the way to work or are they in a library? Um, we need to think about, you know, the different operating system environments. We need to think about spacing limitations. 
I myself just upgraded my phone because I kept running out of space. And if we're giving files that are so huge and they're not usable as easily in the mobile environment. What about those situations like today where something goes down and we don't have internet access or we have to restart something. So that's, that's where I'm finding more of my interest is going is how do we create something that at a baseline can be turned into a more customized format depending upon the user and the user's needs and their technology and their, their experience and their history. So um, that's what I would offer. I would also offer that I find it fascinating that disability world actually needs to work more in line with faculty or content creators in order to create accessible materials. I feel very much removed in my position of not being able to actually connect with the people I need to connect with. And so I am very intrigued at this partnership with OTN and with these other fabulous accessibility um, practitioners and, and users to figure out how can we as, as you know, countries, nations, campuses and such, how can we work together to get information to the people that have a lot of control over content? And then how do we ourselves model creating something that can be usable by virtually anyone? So that's my, those are my thoughts. Excellent. So I have to say for, for people who thought they had 10 minutes and were told cruelly that they only had five minutes, you guys did an awesome job of keeping everything um, both concise and super useful. Um, so just, I just wanted to mention, I, I don't think I did mention it uh, at the beginning, um, but the context of four people who've just spoken are all on the accessibility working group that we've got going at Rebus, um, which anyone is welcome to join. And the idea is to try to do, I think what Krista just expressed is try to map out sort of a general approach um, that, again, you know, does encompass things like, uh, let's have, make sure the HTML tags the checklist piece of that, but also how can we start thinking about the whole authoring process, getting accessibility built into how we're thinking about creating open textbooks right from the beginning. So we have a working group who that is tasked with sort of chewing on those ideas, which I think, yeah, Zoe's just posted a link in the, in the chat. So that's sort of somewhere where I would encourage people to go after this discussion. Um, and now I think I will um, open things up for questions for everyone. Um, and I guess the way we'll do it is if people can just type the questions into the sidebar and then I'll read them out or someone will read them out. Um, so we'll have a pause while people think. <laughs> Are there any from further up that... Uh, no, okay, so... So that was can such just, a good, yes, go ahead. Can I appreciate something that I think Krista said and something that Michelle said? I'm feeling appreciative. Um, so Thank Michelle, I, I quite like the, the, what you said about um, being an expert. I mean, it, it's, it's a funny word, isn't it? Um, there really isn't a guidebook to being an expert in this. And I think it's because it has to be, um, it has to be something that we practice. It's, it's you're a practitioner, right? Um, you strive to get better at it and to ask different questions, but inclusion and accessibility should never be thought of as a task. Um, it's not a task that you start and end. It's a, it's a commitment that you make and that you practice and that you learn new things as you interact with more people and, um, and you learn new things, as, as Chris was saying, when you think about different contexts. Context is so, so important to all of this. This is, this is where we, we at the IDRC redefine disability and we, we call it a mismatch between the individual and what they want to accomplish with whatever it is they're working with. It takes it completely out of the realm of, you know, the, the sort of medicalized model of disability and it entirely puts it into understanding an individual, which is all about empathy and all about storytelling and all about narrative. 
and all about our uniquenesses. And then it also contextualizes it and says, I'm on a bus and that's adding to all of this. So I really appreciated those comments. Yeah, I think that's the important thing is this idea that accessibility, I like Yuta who works um, with Jess who's the director at the IDRC, she had this notion that really resonated with me that if you design well for the people at the edges of your community, you end up with a much more robust and more powerful thing that you're building and, and a much more flexible um, thing, whatever that is. And so I think in the open textbook and open education world, that's a really interesting way to think about it that just makes it better if we, if we take accessibility as, as a core piece. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. Um, so this is from Rachel. Has anyone developed an intake uh, form for the questions to ask professors, instructional designers? So we're beginning this consultations with instructors as we have launched a grant program and we are creating an intake form from scratch, which will include accessibility questions. I'm wondering if anyone has formalized this anywhere. Um, I don't know if anyone. Uh, yeah. you all, I'll comment on that. Rachel, this is um, actually really exciting. So in the authoring guide, we have an intake form that could be a good place for you to jump off. However, there's a long way to go in terms of accessibility considerations. And so maybe this is something we can stay in touch about um, as you guys develop questions, or maybe we'll think of a few right here in this office hours so that for the next iteration of this intake form, it will be more um, inclusive and thoughtful and have those accessibility questions. So there's the link to um, something uh, that could be a good starting point. And then um, maybe some of our guests have good ideas in terms of what questions could be added. Thank you, Karen. Anyone else uh, on intake forms? Um, so Dorothy uh, from Oregon State says they have one that they use as starting point. It includes discussion about accessibility, showing them why it's so important. So again, one of the things that we're trying to do both with these calls and with the accessibility working group is to try to surface this work that everyone's doing individually so that we can spread that around. So Dorothy, we'd love to see, I don't know if you're comfortable sharing that, but we'd be delighted if, if we could see that. Yeah. Um, Chris Woodley has a uh, question, very specific question, um, which is how do we deal with, sorry, it's just jumping around here, um, fill in the blank type questions used in textbooks. Does anyone have sort of a very practical solution to how to deal with accessible fill in the blank questions? Yeah, I just copy and pasted what I put in my team's manual. So these are guidelines we came up with the student who is blind, who is in an ESL course. And so there's a lot of fill in the blanks for the, that program. And so we actually sit down with the student, I think the instructor and also our Braille experts on campus to come up with how do you format the Word document that we send off to the Braille Ready program, Duxbury, to create a file that can then be embossed. So I just copy and pasted um our guidelines so take it for what it's worth though it was kind of created for a sort of a specific situation it may not fit everybody though um i have i have a question for uh all of you folks i guess um i saw a, a comment or tweet i think from tara robertson who's a, a librarian in british columbia who said, and said something like uh, 250 hours, staff hours spent remediating or making accessible a commercial textbook. That's basically 250 wasted hours that should be sort of dealt with in, in a better way. I'm wondering those of you who are on the remediation side, whether you, you can comment on kind of how much effort and time and resources go into that. Because to me, sort of looking at the open textbook universe, it seems like that is a there is a case to be made that it makes more sense to spend that money making accessible OER from the beginning rather than remediating commercial content. So it'd be interesting to know what those numbers look like. Um, I could speak to that, I guess. Um, I'm not really working with the commercial textbooks, but still remediating open textbooks. Um, but I'm working on a text on physical geology right now, and it has a lot of really complex images all through the book. And it's taking me hours and hours and hours 
to describe these images in a way that would make sense to someone who couldn't see them. Um, so if that had been, if that had something that the author had considered from the beginning, it, um, the author would be in a much better place to describe those images, having been a subject matter expert and not trying to learn the content as I do it. Um, so for sure, if it was more um, part of the authoring process, it would save a lot of time, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I echo what Josie said. I can give you some numbers. Um, so we're on the quarter system. So since beginning of April, my 15 student and temporary workers have put in about 1800 hours remediating textbooks and doing some other slightly related things um, in a full transparency. It cost us about $27,000. And for captioning, we've captioned couple hundred hours of videos that have equated to over $50,000 in remediation costs. Do, do you know roughly how many textbooks you're touching? With textbooks, we are touching, um, let me, yeah, I can look it up actually and I can give you a, a better answer. I can give you a legit answer here. So I'll mute myself and um, Rachel's got a comment here. Could anyone comment on the community response to efforts to make OERs accessible? Has the campus felt it successful, um, that the efforts were sufficient or insufficient? So I think that question is, um, you know, when we make this case out to the both creators and consumers of OER, is accessibility resonating both, I think, on the authoring side and the consumption side? Is that, is that about right, Rachel? Did I capture that? So may, I'm going to point at Karen. I don't know if that's the right person, but anyone have any comments on, on how accessibility is resonating within the campus? I can comment anecdotally in terms of the Open Textbook Library and the questions that we receive regarding um, the resources that are in there. Because the library is a referatory and we have hundreds of books by a wide variety of authors and publishers, it reflects a wide variety of levels of accessibility. And so unlike BC Campus, which has uh, a standard and has someone like Josie um, looking at what's in their library there, um, it's not one of our requirements for inclusion in the library. But I will say that it is um, more and more a part of the conversation that we have and the inquiries that we get. So I would say that, um, as other people have said in office hours, it is, it is a priority and there are a lot of um, sort of exciting ped pedagogical opportunities at the forefront too that are here. Excellent. Okay, so there's a question here from Al. Um, if I could just add one thing to that, Hugh. So um, I would, I had a conversation earlier with the director of our uh, Office for Students with Disabilities, and I just wanted to encourage everyone who leads, whether it's a task force or a coalition or an advisory board or whatever it is you call these things, to reach out to your Office of Students with Disabilities to get their feedback. Um, we really need their input to do this well, uh, and we need it from the start. So I'd, I'd actually reached out to her to see if I could get those numbers that you were asking about, and we're still in the middle of our academic year, so she didn't really have those to share at this point. But she did make a note that, um, we talked a little about open textbooks and how that might impact the workload of that that office and she said that open textbooks would be absolutely wonderful and would significantly improve the kind of work that they can do while also reducing the workload doing those kinds of remedial um, rem remediation, whatever, task uh, related to commercial textbooks. Can you just add to that that um, just in response to that question, um, I forget whose question it was now, but uh, if, if the text is not meeting the needs of either the individual or the institution, the advantage of the open textbooks is that you have the possibility of doing it. So if Michelle uh, puts the energy and time in from her team to create an accessible version of a, of a, a textbook, uh, now I can reuse that. And if I need to build on that, I can, and then contribute it back. And so it has this kind of crowdsourcing 
additive quality to it where um, again it's a it's the practice of accessibility and inclusion and uh, by virtue of it being an open education resource we can actually conduct that practice great um, so there's a follow-up here from Rachel uh, and and the question is is the fact that OER is supposed to be accessible is that resonating like do people are people actually recognizing that as a real benefit and are they sort of noticing that it is accessible and that is doing something so I'll just read exactly what she says also how have people felt about the actual efforts uh, do they think that OERs were successfully accessible? Anyone? Anyone want to? Want to? I'll just I'll just comment on um, whenever we approach professors to talk about document remediation, which is a little bit different than OER, but um, they're totally for it. They love it until you say hey we need you to devote x amount of hours to help us making that accessible and then they start a little bit like rightfully so i don't have the time i don't have the bandwidth i don't have the expertise so everybody loves the idea of it but there's not as many volunteers working with us during the remediation process and this is where we go, oh good that's exactly the kind of thing that we hope that the rebus community as we progress can help leverage, you know, instead of having to find the volunteers each campus at a time that we could try to systematize this so that we could get a collection of biology, you know, uh, biology students or biology experts who are interested in doing that remediation or geology so that Josie doesn't have to figure out what the difference between granite and gneiss is, etc. Which is a good thing to know, but um, okay, uh, a couple of other questions. There was a question here about STEM interactive. Um, so math, physics, chem, I'm working with a math professor here on campus thinking about open pedagogy that is modular and accessible. Any thoughts on translating interactive visual models from an HTML5 canvas to tactile learning experience? So uh, unless anyone else wants to take that, maybe Jess, you can uh, go into a bit more detail about the FET work that you guys were doing. Yeah, I mean, it's not to tactile, that's, that's sort of the next frontier, but um, we've been working with, um, well, I guess, is it tactile? Maybe it's not. So we've been working with the FET group. Uh, they do physics simulations and they're about to dive into math simulations as well. So you can expect more, I think, around inclusion and math coming out of that collaboration. But uh, we've been working with them on their physics simulations, which, as I mentioned, are very visual and are very interactive. And the idea is you've got John Travolta rubbing his foot on a carpet and accumulating charges and then touching a doorknob and releasing the charges because he's creating, a, I guess, a, an open circuit. Um, something like that. Anyway. <laughs> um, the, the challenge has been really thinking about how to make that the sort of thing that somebody can discover uh, without a mouse and without the visual cues and still get the experience. And we've employed a lot of different techniques in doing this. One has been we've been spending a lot of time in audio and actually making um, uh, audio alternatives. So it started with our chart authoring tool, which if you go to our website, you can see a chart that's actually been um, uh, sort of created using audio cues. So charts are a great one because they're so visual. We expect that from a chart you can get both a quick glance when you look at it, you can see one pie is bigger than the rest, for instance. Um, and it gives you a good sense of overall magnitude of the different things and how they're related. And then um, translating that into audio those were some of the ways that we approached the physics simulations as well. We also had to do um, some work with grids to think about how, even just to think about how the text that's being read would be meaningful to a student in not a patronizing way. So it would be meaningful in that the student would understand what's happening in the space 
but uh, it wouldn't sort of reveal the trick of the physics principle that was being explained. So it actually wound up being a lot of um, diving into non-technical pieces. It was a lot of describing an event. So we worked with the folks at FET who are physics experts um, and physics scholars, and they helped us figure out what those words would be uh, as alternatives and, and for screen readers to give cues to the learner and then did a lot of testing as well. Um, I hope that that scratches a little bit of the question. Um, scrolling up to see here if I've missed anything. Maybe, um, yeah, Krista's just posted here. Maybe Krista, you can uh, talk through that, the numbers that you, you had. Just gives kind of us a handle on um, what kind of effort goes into removing. Yeah, so the numbers I shared were from April 1st until now, I've had about 15 student and temporary workers remediate 109 textbooks. Those textbooks range anywhere from simple novels that are like 50 pages in length to um, biology books that are 2,000 pages in length. We've also had some medical books in there. Um, we convert about 100 pages per hour for non-STEM materials, and that's including the scanning, the OCRing, the debinding, the editing, and so on. Um, we convert about 10 pages per hour for STEM content. So we're 10 times faster if it's non-STEM content. And all that equates to about $27,000 in, um, not in the red, because that just sounds bad, but just we spent about $27,000 supporting our students with disabilities. And is it correct that under copyright law that that work that you do can't be shared with your colleagues down the road at University of Oregon? Oregon is um, yes, according to law, we are not, the materials we convert are only for the student with the disability. Um, that is one of the, the stipulations, yeah. And the other, so copyright is a part of that. The other factor that affects how people can share um, is how fees can be used, how funding can be used at the institution. So here at UTA, the office has to work to support UTA students. So we couldn't, uh, she, she had an example of um, having a, I don't know what this is called, creating braille uh, resources. Um, they have a machine that allows us to do that, but we can't create something that could be used at a community college, for example, because everything that they do has to benefit UTA students. So there's copyright and then there's also where the fees come from, where the funding comes from. There is a question here from William about if anyone knows about the accessibility taken into create, uh, consideration in Google Docs, um, once exported as an EPUB and then imported to Pressbooks to those. So right, if you've got things marked up in Google Docs, exported and brought into Pressbooks, um, how well do all those, that semantic markup translate? Um, I bet Zoe is going to be the best <laughs> person to answer that question. Uh, sorry, we're coordinating laptops. There we go. Uh, right, so bringing um, Google Doc content into Pressbooks, we have found that a lot of extra code gets carried over anyway in terms of the headings. Um, we have seen that they do come over. However, we have recently discovered as part of the work we've been doing with this working group from our wonderful speakers who've all conducted reviews of the output from a Pressbooks book. Um, we have found that some of our heading uh, structure isn't, isn't as good as it could be. Um, so we are flagging that to do some work on it. Um, we would also really like to, uh, and I'm just going to 
say this in front of you and hopefully get us to commit to it. At some point, we would love to have a proper import from Google Docs because it seems to be where a lot of people are working uh, on these materials. And certainly within the, the Rebus community, the books we're working on, because it is collaborative, Google Docs is one of the best collaborative tools that we have available for creating content together. Um, so as it stands right now, it's okay. Uh, but I certainly think that if we, it, it will get better in some ways. As I say, we're going to look at restructuring our headings and make sure that book title is H1, chapter H2, and then H3 and all. Yeah, see the face uh, Hugh's making. Um, but this is one of the observations that's come out of, of the work that we've been doing. Uh, so okay, but to get better. Um, yes, so one of the complexities is trying to figure out how to do semantic markup correctly, which um, for a full structure of a book, when it has different expressions, sometimes it's one full uh, document and sometimes it's multiple pages and semantic markup doesn't actually handle that particularly well. Um, so here's a comment from Rachel about copyright. So copyright limitations are responsive. So the conversion can happen only in response to a particular student request and thus wouldn't be able to be shared between institutions if the material is still in copyright. However, there are efforts to propose national repository which would allow retrieval provided the requesting campus also holds the title. Uh, these efforts are nascent um, and the Marrakesh Treaty, which is ratified by the US and I'm sure will continue to be, um, will affect these limitations. So the Marrakesh Treaty, my understanding, is anyone a copyright expert here? My understanding of the Marrakesh Treaty is that um, it works, it, it's going to make these kinds of uh, solutions easier. Um, I don't know if, if uh, yeah, actually I'm gonna defer there. My, I've had a few conversations about Marrakesh, but um, I know it's a good thing generally, but beyond that, I'm not too sure. Um, but the point is that it's, it's, you know, my read on it is that copyright makes all of this so much more difficult. And the nice thing about OER is that we can solve these problems once across the, across the board for a single, um, a single text or a single resource. And then everyone gets access to that benefit right out of the box. Um, and that, that really seems hugely powerful here. Grackle. We will check. So William says we should check Grackle. So I assume that's some kind of, uh, so this is from Katya. Uh, the big thing about Marrakesh is that it would allow exchange of accessible text across borders between countries who have ratified it. See, so uh, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, and copyright involves risk management. Does it ever? Um, so OER just makes all that stuff go away, really. Yeah, and I think, you know, when it, when it comes to um, copyright, OER, and accessibility, you know, the, the, again, just the power of the system to allow us to um, do this work, especially if we do it right from the start, um, that just, just really, the, the power of that is, is pretty clear for, for us. So I think I, one of the things I, I, a question I put out to you guys is about how, um, how we can sort of take that message and really make it a, is it worth making that a central part of the case for OER? And if so, how do we go about doing that? Anyone? Michelle, I saw you nod, so I'm going to call on you. <laughs> I, 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 yes, we should, and we should do it by talking about it. Um, setting good examples, I think, is a part of it, and, um, and talking about it. So Hugh and I are presenting at Open Education Conference on this very topic in no November, October, sometime this fall. So um, I'd say that's a step in the right direction, as ensuring that presentations and um, conversations about this topic and why it's so important are happening where people who are involved in OER are already assembling. 
And I, I think what's important too is like touching the people who wrestle with this on an ongoing basis, you know, those librarians who are suffering through finding the, the solutions to remediation problems that, and, you know, gathering this group of um, advocates for, for what we're all trying to do. Um, so it's uh, 3.53 here, which is seven minutes early. Um, I see that the, the questions have slowed down on the chat. Um, I see there was a couple of notes about a tool called Grackle, which has been posted here. So um, take a look at that uh, for converting Google Docs, I think. Um, but I think we can wrap it up. Does anyone else have any more questions or comments? Leave the floor open. Could I just add one? So I, I didn't talk as much about my student intern as I initially planned, um, but I just want to make a plug for involving your students in this kind of work on campus. Um, undergraduate students in, particularly, in particular have uh, a lot to offer. Um, so even if you don't have a disability studies program with a required practicum, like I have the benefit of here at UTA, I think there are still lots of opportunities to engage with those students. Um, so seek them out no matter what. You can have really good allies there, and it's really a win-win for everyone involved. So the student I was working with in the spring semester, for example, is co-authoring a chapter with me on the work that she did over the course of the semester. So she's leaving not only with that practical experience where she's applying what she's learned in her courses, but she also has a publication coming from that experience. And um, there's nothing, there's nothing quite that beats something like that. So, so do seek out those students and try to engage with them as often as you can. I'm going to take um, just a uh, riff on that a little bit. It's one of the things that we're hoping from the Rebus point of view that we can help make the frameworks for um, basically you, or leveraging the enthusiasm of students to get engaged with stuff to, to make it a lot easier. Um, you know, there's some question when we talk about what we're trying to do at, at Rebus, a lot of, you know, one of the complaints people have is, is well, I don't want a uh, undergrad student editing my chapter of, of or submitting a chapter uh, in my intro to philosophy textbook, for instance. Um, and that might not be what you want, but, but the fact is there is sort of this great um, resource of people who are keen and excited about doing good for the universe. And so finding ways to help them do that uh, at scale is kind of what, what one of the things that we'd like to help do. So yay, plus one for students doing really great work. Okay, um, I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I want to thank uh, our four speakers especially. Um, you guys did a fantastic job. This, this seems to me to be such a critical piece of what OER can do right, and, and the, the value of getting it right is going to be um, very powerful. So thank you very much, all of you. And thanks to all the um, participants who submitted questions and for all of you who hung around. The videos will be up uh, sometime soon, so you can share this around or revisit it. Um, Karen, I'll, I'll leave it to you to do the final sign off. Sounds good. I will echo Hugh's gratitude. Thank you to our four guests for sharing their experience. And I'm going to say it, your expertise. And thanks to the Office Hour participants for also um, their questions so that we have a good sense of what's going on out there and, and how we can work together to improve things. I would also like to say that we have our next Office Hours coming up. Uh, Liz and I and uh, Hugh have been working on that. It's July 26, 2 p.m. Eastern. I hope it's okay. I start plugging this, you guys. Uh, the yes. topic, okay, good. <laughs> um, and the topic is keeping uh, open textbooks up to date, and um, it will be in the same format. And I could imagine questions of accessibility and how we can include and incorporate that into revisions could also be a part of it. So we hope that you um, can join us again. Excellent. And uh, thank you, Karen. 
Um, and Zoe does want to say something about the accessibility working group. Is that right? Yes. I uh, just want to put in another plug for the working group, if this is something of interest to you going on. Uh, right now, we are collating the results of the reviews that have been done, and out of that will come an overview document that we'll be looking for feedback on um, for people both who are working with this really closely and others who might not be as familiar to make to work towards something that makes sense for the people on the ground creating content and so hope to see you all there.